and welcome to a new episode of the Credible News Roundup, your one-stop shop for all the news from West Asia. My name is Esteban Carrillo. I am the head of news for the Cradle. As usual, I am joined by my colleagues, content creator and writer for the Cradle, Karim Shami, and U.S. investigative journalist, William Van Wagenen. How are you guys? How's everything uh, this this week? Oh, good. Yeah, pretty good. Tired, but good. Tired, but good. Yeah, so that's good to hear. How about you, Karim? <laughs> A lot of stuff going on. And many, many <laughs> deaths. Sleeping. Sleeping. <laughs> yeah, I don't think, uh, you know, many of us are getting too much sleep uh, these days. And now, you know, we have, uh, we, we, we want to talk about what happened in, in, in the Syria-Jordan border. When uh, apparently, you know, uh, oh, no, actually, no, they did take uh, responsibility, the Iraqis. The Islamic resistance in Iraq, this umbrella group that uh, of uh, armed factions within the Iraqi resistance, the, the popular mobilization units, they take responsibility for an attack on the Syrian uh, Jordan border on a U.S. position. And this is, uh, reportedly, is the first time since the Korean War that an aerial attack has killed U.S. service members. Also, this is essentially the first time that uh, the U.S. has announced that U.S. troops have died since the start of the Gaza war. Now, U.S. troops are present across the region. How many how many troops are in the region? Can we, I know we've done this before. We, we've done no, no, we, we did an infograph. I will pick it, uh, grab it up. Did you, uh, did William finish? I think it was like 2,500 in uh, Iraq and 900 in Syria, they said. So yeah, they say they have 900 in Syria, 900 troops uh, in Syria. They have uh, 2,500. In Iraq, but I think the count is actually, you know, is yeah. it? What, what will we have? Based on the research that, that we did, in Syria they have 22 military sites and uh, 2,000 troops, while in Jordan they have two main military bases. One of them uh, is the one that uh, they claimed it was struck, and uh, they have 3,000 troops there. In Jordan? In Jordan. Yeah. And they'll be, they, the presence of, of, of US troops in Jordan, this has been ongoing now for decades. Yeah, it's it's gone it's uh, it's gone for decades, decades, and uh, we know that uh, that U.S. military aid to Jordan is around 1.4 billion dollars annually. Ooh. So yeah, of course uh, the U.S. have like uh, can exert pressure on the Jordan uh, Jordanian army and government. Like enough pressure to maybe make them say, "Don't say yeah, we yeah, got it in Syria. Yeah, say we got it in Jordan." Yeah, Jordan is a country that rely on uh, foreign aid either by, from the U.S. or from Saudi Arabia and U UAE mainly nowadays. So a lot, many people are still, yeah, and the news is conflicting whether uh, the attack happened inside Syria or inside, inside Jordan. But uh, if it happened inside Syria and the U.S. forced the Jordanians to say, no, it's inside Jordan, because at the beginning, Jordan said, no, it's, it's not inside our, uh, uh, our ter territory. But... Uh, saying that the, the attack happened inside Jordan will help the U.S. when it retaliates against uh, this attack, as they said that they will retaliate, but they are thinking, uh, we will, uh, will we retaliate inside Syria or Iraq or, or both? Because uh, the U.S. president says uh, there is legal because the Jordanians and the Jordanian king want this president. But uh, in Syria, it's illegal. And yeah, they have 22 military sites which are illegal, the Syrian government and the Syrian people don't want this, uh, this military presence. So uh, if the attack happened inside Syria, then the attack, uh, people will come and say, or the Americans, especially now that there's an election, people will say what we are doing in Syria. So this is the point. So yeah, that's a very good point, Karim. It's the, the real question here is what are U.S. troops doing in Syria? Because, okay, Jordan, we get it. They're a U.S. ally, you know, all, all that jazz. But uh, in Syria, it's, uh, they control the oil fields, they control uh, the wheat producing regions of, of the country. And the borders, because I think the main presence of the US troops there is to block, to block uh, the borders between Syria and Iraq, because uh, the US and the officials, are, they are very clear, they, they don't want a road from Iran to Iraq to Syria to Lebanon. Because this will will give Iran uh, direct access to the Mediterranean and will strengthen the resistance in, in, in these countries. That's why most of the retaliation that the U.S. Uh, takes after each attack is to bomb uh, a place called Bukaman, which is the only uh, crossing that the resistance uh, controls in this in, in this region. 
this uh, the Abu Kamal is is a crossing that uh, connects Syria to Iraq. So this is constant bond, and I think uh, when they retaliate because they said that then they will and Biden uh, went on TV and and slept like one minute for uh, before threatening before threatening. So uh, I think they retaliate in uh, in Abu Kamal and they might uh, strike uh, a military base for the Syrian army also because they said that the retaliation will. Uh, be an escalation by time, and they, as I understood, and at first they will bump something, something small, and by time they will retaliate more and more and more. Oh. Well, one thing to point out too: the reason that the troops are there at um, Tower Twenty Two in Tanif, the Tanif base, that area is right uh, on the border of Jordan, Syria, and Iraq. But the U.S. has been using Jordan as a staging point to basically train. Uh, rebel groups um, to attack the Syrian government to try to affect re regime change in Syria ever since, like, well, 2011. Who are these rebel groups? Well, specifically in, in 2012 is when it became more public, like uh, the CIA director David Petraeus and the Saudi uh, head of intelligence at the time, Prince Bandar bin Sultan, they opened an operations room in Jordan in order to train um, groups like the Free Syrian, so called Free Syrian Army. Um, which basically was Jabhat al-Nusra or al-Qaeda. Those groups were basically mixed together in the same. So the U.S. would, with the Saudis, they started this big airlift, basically, where they would buy weapons in Croatia, Serbia. Uh, the Saudis would then fly the weapons to Jordan, and then from Jordan they would give them to these uh, rebel groups, and they would go across the border and do attacks on uh, the Syrian government you know, to try to overthrow Bashar al-Assad. So Jordan has always been this major staging point. And again, the U.S. would say, oh, we're giving the weapons to the moderate rebels, the Free Syrian Army. But then those Free Syrian Army groups would just pass the weapons right on to al-Qaeda, Jabhat al-Nusra, and also to ISIS. And so then, is like in 2015 or 16, I have to double check, but they established that Atanif base right on the border. 15. Uh, so that... Tower 22 and the Atanif base, I mean, that's why it's hard to know, like, which was really hit because they're, like, right near each other. And the U.S. has that 55-kilometer buffer zone around it. And so from there, they've been able to continue, like, training these uh, so-called rebel groups to go out into the into Syria, like in the Badia area of the desert near Palmyra in Homs, uh, govern it, and carry out attacks. So earlier this year, we saw, like, the, tons of those attacks against all the truffle hunters. Yeah, like they, they would be kidnapping the truffle hunters, uh, extorting them. But then there was also all the attacks on the Syrian army. Uh, the, the one on the graduation ceremony that killed uh, like dozens of civilians. They've been hitting uh, Syrian army buses, killing them, uh, you know, by, by the dozens. So, and so all of that is like using Jordan as a base. So Jordan is really important. And it's interesting what you said. I didn't know that, that there's 3,000 troops at Tower 22. Because again, it's like the U.S. is always saying, oh, we just have a few troops in Syria. Yeah, the total is 3,000. Like a cross Jordan. In Jordan. Or in Jordan. Yeah, in Jordan. But that's probably like, a lot of them. Yeah, yeah. It's not, uh, surrounding uh, Tower 22, they have 250 soldiers uh, only there, which is, I think, Tanaf is, is, is a very big uh, base. And as you mentioned, there's 55 kilometers. Uh, as a buffer zone, nobody knows what's happened, what happens inside. Well, and the other thing to mention is that in because of that buffer zone, there's been times when the Syrian army tried to like enter those areas, and then the U.S. would immediately bomb them from the air. But that's the areas from which ISIS came in 2019 and carried out that terrible massacre in Sweda government, uh, government uh, in Syria, where ISIS raided all these Druze villages and massacred like a couple hundred people. So, anyways, it's, Jordan is a really um, crucial staging point for um, the U.S. to be able to do all this like crazy stuff within Syria. Also, to help enforce the sanctions, as you mentioned, you know, trying to block any ability of the Syrians and, and the Iranians and the Iraqis, both to just trade regular things, you know, to move goods back and forth across the border, but also potentially move weapons from Iran to Iraq to Syria to Lebanon. Yeah, so that, the base is really important, I guess. Yeah, and now I see the forces of Jordan is, is rising and rising because it's a stable country, although it's not a rich country, but you don't see, like, protests in Jordan or hey, there's no uh, uh, Iranian influence or, like, uh, it is an it is influence there, yani. The Americans there, they take, 
just uh, a fact, I want to mention that, for instance, in Iraq, if you go to Iraq, you will not see U.S. soldiers. They will stay in their base. So when they when they finish their training and go back home, you don't see them in the, the U.S. soldier, and uh, even in Syria. But in Jordan, the U.S. Army feel very comfortable. You go to the pubs, you see the U.S. soldiers. You go grocery store, you see the U.S. soldiers. So the U.S. there feel comfortable. And now I think the Jordan is more important, especially what's happening in Gaza. And now the escalation in Syria and Iraq, it will be a hub for retaliation. Uh, I see in short term and the long term also. But so, you know, I just want to bring up something that, uh, well, first of all, it sounds like in Jordan, there's no Iran out graffiti, no? Everyone's out there. Uh, but other than that, uh, something that Will brought up uh, before we started recording, and this is that uh, about like half of the Jordanian population, they have their roots in Palestine. Yeah, well, and uh, and you say, okay, so there's no there's no really protest in Jordan. Well, there's no protest in the scale that we see them in, you know, in Iraq, maybe Lebanon, uh, in in other places. But um, when this war started, when 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 the massacre of Palestinians in Gaza started. Uh, Jordanians w were trying to rush the border, demanded that the government let them through. And what did the government do? They they fired tear gas at them. They you know sent out shock troops to to push them back. Yeah, exactly. They are easily controlled. Even if the Jordanians they support Palestine, but they don't have the power in the streets. It's not a like, democratic country. They will not like elect another king. So they they live with what 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 they have. And of course the king is. Uh, uh, he has the heritage of his father and and his uh, grandfather, which all of them were like followers for the West. And we know he's uh, half British. His mother is British, and most of his life was in the UK. And then when his dad uh, uh, died, he came back. So, and he yeah. has uh, and he has British like yeah, he's security guard. Yeah, I don't know. If Everyone around him yeah, are, are British, like special forces. That and when he talks in Arabic, you feel that. He's like he's not a native Ar uh, Arabic speaker. He speaks uh, better in, in uh, English and especially the UK accent, of course. So I want to go back to something that you were saying, Karim, because uh, you know about the U.S. retaliation. You said maybe they will bomb uh, Bukamal crossing because this is the only crossing in which uh, the Syrian government is in control from Iraq. But uh, what Biden has said is that uh, he blamed Iranian-backed uh, militant groups for the attack. And we know now that, uh, well, we've known for the past several weeks that uh, the Islamic resistance in Iraq has been, has launched uh, like uh, well uh, over 150 attacks between uh, rockets, missiles, and drones on U.S. bases. And the U.S. has already retaliated against this militia. They're naming Kataib Hezbollah. The last time they killed uh, uh, a leader, uh, it was, uh, I believe, was affiliated with Kataib Hezbollah. He wasn't. Uh, I think it was the New Jibbam. It was a new job. The, the Baghdad base and the Ministry of Interior. Yeah, so they bombed, you know, the Ministry of Interior. They are saying uh, now is is Qatar Hezbollah. So you know, if they decide to bomb Syria, that's not going to hurt the Iraqis at all. The Iraqi resistance. If they decide to bomb Iraq, it might hurt the, the Iraqi resistance, but it's also going to push back that uh, to to increase the pressure to see U.S. troops leave the country. And that's that's kind of the, the catch-22 right now, the quagmire for Biden. Because if they keep bombing Iraq, they're not going to get in the good graces of the Iraqi government. They're going to get more pressure from the Iraqi government, which is, in in you know in one way or another, is allied with the public mobilization units under the, the coordination framework uh, apparatus. Uh, you know, uh, Mohammed uh, Shia al-Sudani came to power with the support of the CF, and now he's saying we need to see U.S. troops leave. U.S. officials have been saying, yeah, yeah, we're going to start talks. They actually started on Sunday. But then, you know, a few days later, they said, but these talks, you know, like, don't expect us to actually leave Iraq. You know, and like, uh, wink, wink, we're going to talk with Sudani. It's similar to the quagmire they find themselves in uh, in Yemen. You know, like, how do we actually retaliate at this point without hurting more of our interests? But in Iraq, and this, I guess they have a bill, no? Like, do you think there's, there's a, like, the, the, the Kurdish region seems to always be playing in the in in support of whatever the U.S.'s plan for uh for the the their presence in Iraq is, and even a few days ago, the PM Barzani said, uh, you know, we need we still need the U.S. presence in Iraq. 
Yeah, I mean, the Kurdish region is much more closely allied with the U.S. than other elements of the Iraqi central government, for sure, especially the security forces. Part of it is the U.S. pays a lot of the salaries of the Peshmerga, the Kurdish security forces. Literally, they just get their salaries paid by the U.S. So clearly, they're going to be very dependent on uh, on on uh, the U.S. presence and U.S. involvement in Iraq. But you're right, it's tricky for Sudani because he, as the prime minister, he's trying to manage... He has to manage good relations, if he can, with the U.S., and then manage good relations with uh, the PMF groups, and he has to manage good relations with Iran. But every time the U.S. does a strike, uh, they killed, I think, five um, uh, PMF members in Kirkuk a couple months ago, and then again, the strike on Baghdad. And then um, every time the U.S. does something in Iraq, it makes it harder for Sudani to kind of say to the U.S., yes, you can stay here. That it, There's always more popular pressure on him to say, okay, well, I guess we need to ask the U.S. to go because they keep bombing us, you know what I mean? So um, you're right, there's that, that catch-22, I think, for the U.S. The more they try to retaliate in Iraq, the more uh, of a push there will be uh, internally in Iraq for the U.S. Uh, forces to leave, you know? Well, I think, uh, unfortunately, whatever happens in Syria and in Iraq, Nobody cares. Nobody cares about the government or the Iraqi army or the Syrian army. So the only major players now we see in Iraq, we see the Kurds and the PMU or the resistance. And in Syria, there's no major player. Although there are, because also we have Russians, the, the Americans, the Turks, the Hezbollah. So everyone's in Syria. It's like uh, Salam. Okay. So you, you don't know which taste is like stronger than the others. So Syria, where, whatever they do in Syria, it will not affect anything, I think. The Americans, if they retaliate, it will be, for instance, if they retaliate against the army, which is which I expect, it will be like another attack. But in, in Iraq, it's different. So first, uh, as he mentioned, that uh, the Kurdistan region is very important for, for the U.S., especially that the Kurds span on more than one country. So if they made the Kurds very strong in Iraq, as they are doing, and they don't create a chaos there, the, the, the Americans. So then they will have, uh, they can easily then control the Kurds in Syria, the Kurds in uh, in Turkey, and the Kurds in Iran. So, so the uh, Kurdistan region in Iraq is very important, and I think the U.S. will fight to keep it stable and to keep it under its wings because uh, because we know the the Americans, especially in this region, they 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 think. Uh, for years to come, okay, and they have plans for years to come. As what happened in 2001, they said, uh, I forgot his name, this gentleman that said, we have a plan to invade Iraq, Sudan. To destabilize. Yeah, yeah. The, Lebanon. And, and Syria and Lebanon also, and this was in 2001 or 2002. Yeah, Wesley Clark. Yeah, and uh, it was uh, in 2001 or 2000, 2002, and we see what happened in Syria happened in 2011, which is after 10 years, you know what I mean? And, and of course, also Sudan was split in two, two countries, and Sudan lost one million kilometers squared of its lands. So uh, I think uh, the US will do whatever needed to, uh, to keep uh, uh, the Kurdistan region in Iraq under its wings because in the future, uh, projects, uh, uh, lovely projects that they have for the region, uh, like uh, Kurds will be. Uh, will be used, especially that Kurds, Kurds now they have like, uh, they, they, they love their ethnicity, but we have to know historically they never had a country. And now uh, the superpower of the world came and said, we can make you a country, we can give you a country. But the, haven't they been promising this since like the 90s or the 80s? It's been decades at this point, right? The, yeah, but, that the but, Kurds are getting. But, but nowadays you can see yani, it might happen because the wealth, wealthiest region in Iraq is. Kurdistan Iraq, the most stable is Kurdistan Iraq, and they have the oil, and the US is behind them. So I think it might become a reality, and especially that we know the uh, as they have in northern Syria, which is on the borders of Kurdistan Iraq, they are also Kurds and they are also backed by by the US. So I think in the future the US and the West they want to merge this region, uh, these two regions together and make them one country. And from this country, they uh, can fight or uh, have a bigger 
presence in the region, in northern Syria and northern Iraq, and in the future, because Turkey is getting stronger and stronger, and we see a uh, uh, guy like Erdogan, although he's like fully aligned with the West, but sometimes he take uh, take uh, he takes his own decisions. And for uh, this not to happen again, they have to say to Turkey, "Look, we have this region; we can make them expand it into your lands because there's also millions of the Kurds in in, in, in Turkey and also Iran. There's, I think, like." Five million, six million Kurds in, in Iraq, and we know that what happened in Masa Amini, it happened in the Kurdistan region of Iran. Well, she was from the Kurdistan. Yes, region. she she was. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. Sorry, it sparked the protest. Yeah, but that, that pro the protest sparked also in the Kurdistan oh, region. Yeah, sure. so this area is super important for theirs. If if I am uh, from the U.S. and I want to destabilize this region as I am doing, I will like hold this region. Uh, for the future uh, institutions. Well, I was going to say, I mean, I think that's true because it's it's interesting that Turkey, of course, is very angry about the U.S. support for uh, the SDF in northern Syria. Turkey is traditionally closely aligned with uh, the KDP in Kurdistan. but um, And so U.S. support for the KDP that's uh, in Barzani's uh, family, that's totally fine. But in Syria, it's been getting weird because the Turks are very angry about the the SDF, which is an offshoot of the YPJ, uh, which is an offshoot of PKK, which Turkey views as a terrorist uh, organization. They've been fighting a, 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 you know, mm -hmm. a counterinsurgency against for, for decades. So there's been that tension in the Turks. Um, it doesn't get much attention, but the Turks are pretty often bombing northern Iraq, uh, the Kurdistan region. Uh, near Dahuk and near uh, Sinjar, um, and so uh, then the the uh, PKK supposedly has like an al is allied with the PUK, the Kurdish faction that's in control of eastern, uh, northern uh, Iraqi Kurdistan, and the Turks have been very angry about that. They've been bombing the Sulaymaniyah airport. Uh, and the Iranians also are bombing Kurdistan. The Iranians are bombing Kurdistan. Obviously, we know they, they bombed the, the home in uh, Erbil, which they claim was a Mossad base. So there's just a lot going on. But yeah, the Kurdish region is, is super important. So whoever can control it, the U.S., Turkey, the Iranians, it's really important. Um, but again, even the U.S., if they have a strong presence, they can kind of use that to influence all these different countries, even to use that as leverage against the Turks. Even though the U.S. and Turkey are, of course, both members of NATO, their interests don't always align. Erdogan is always kind of flirting with uh, Putin and Russia, and uh, it's it's a it's a very complicated uh, but interesting place. And that geography there is very interesting and so mountainous. Yeah. So it's very difficult for any uh, of these these countries to send their troops inside this region because it's very mountainous and very difficult to fight there. Thank you so much for joining us this week. Please make sure to leave a like, subscribe and follow us on X, on Instagram, and on Telegram. And if you're feeling generous, leave a donation on our Patreon. For the Cradle News Roundup, my name is Esteban Carrillo. I have enjoyed by my colleagues, Karim Shami and William Van Wagen. <laughs>